Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining. And I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we are gathered here on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This is the poster for the Christmas bird count. And more inf if you want more information, you can go to the link or do this QR code. And I wanted to show you also this, this, these are all the different areas that will be involved in the count. It goes from A to Y, not quite set. So we have 25 areas. Thank you, Selena. Um, yeah, our speaker tonight, if, if you haven't all read the, the uh, posting, thoroughly at, on the Nature Vancouver website. Um, Dr. John Elliott is a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And his uh, research focuses mainly on ecotoxicology. Uh, he's a, quite a background at, with many awards in the ecotoxicology field um, going back, gosh, many, many years. And, um, he initiated the studies on American dippers as a, as a water quality bioindicator in the Chilliwack River. After noting that in the UK, European dipper eggs were being sampled to measure contaminants. This followed with his PhD student, Christy Morrissey, identifying that the Chilliwack River system has the highest density of American dippers in the Pacific Northwest. Dr. Elliott will present the natural history of this unique passerine and the science that's been done on the dippers of the Chilliwack River for the past 20 years. And more recently on run of the river dam systems at Whistler. Um, and and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Elliott is also an adjunct professor in biological sciences at Simon University and an adjunct professor in the agroecology department uh, at the University of British Columbia. Um, so without further ado, I will hand you over to John. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Colin. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I used to be uh, back in the days when it was um, Vancouver Natural History Society. Um, when I lived closer to Vancouver, I used to be a regular member of Birders Night, especially, I don't know if anybody that's still around remembers my son, Kyle. Kyle Elliott, who uh, was a very active member, and he and, a, and the biker birder produced that for one of the first uh, guides to Vancouver birds, that Elliott Nelson is still around. Anyway, so yeah, I don't know it was, but then I don't know, we moved out here and we haven't been there too often. <laughs> so Selena, I better do my screen share here and let's see if we can get it right this time. So I think it's this one. Are you seeing the slideshow view? Yeah, it's great. Okay, great. Okay, sure. Let's let's get started. <clears throat> um, I I have to disclose that then because Colin never mentioned I I'm definitely the backup <laughs> dipper presenter dipper speaker. I may even be the third string or fourth string uh, option. It was going to be Christine and. I know some of the students over the years have presented at Birders Night. I know Christy did, you know, probably quite a few years ago. <clears throat> but at the same time, at least, um, I am the person who's been involved in the Dipper work out here for, for longest. And, and I did actually uh, initiate the work back in the day. And it, it got started with, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether Colin mentioned that, with something called the uh, the Georgia Basin Action Plan, which was a federal government initiative to try to address what they perceive as priority environmental problems in what is now, of course, the Salish Sea and the surrounding basin. A lot of it was marine focused, and I was involved in some of the marine work, but <clears throat> I felt that there really needed to be some uh, some more watershed studies, uh, particularly of all the of all the streams and and smaller rivers and that that flow in. And so I got to thinking about options for a riparian indicator and, and, a, and a bird one, because I was Canadian Wildlife Service at the time. And uh, it, the focus is very much on migratory birds and what are technically migratory birds, those that are on the Migratory Birds Convention Act. 
And, uh, but fortunately the dipper who I decided was the way to go is not only a migratory bird, it's, it's an excellent riparian indicator as I hope that I'll convince you. And I was partly inspired by my admiration for this work by people in Wales, um, Steve Ormrod, who is a professor at Cardiff University and his various students over the years, um, such as Stephanie Tyler. So they initiated um, this work to look at the impacts of, um, of acid rain and metal deposition and whatnot in, in, the, uh, in the mountains and hills of Wales using the Dibbert. So I thought, great, I'm gonna propose this. And I got funding, they liked it. <clears throat> and fortunately at the same time, I had a, an intern from UBC who, who had joined us and uh, she was looking for grad um, opportunities. And I said, so Christy, are you interested in, in studying dippers? And she looked into her a bit and said, yeah, no, that would be fantastic. So together we, we wrote a proposal and uh, to look at the population dynamics on the South Coast. And uh, she scouted around a bunch of different sites, including the North Shore, um, I guess up into Manning to some degree, but she settled on, on the Chilliwack River. Excuse me. And we discussed this a little bit of that ahead of time and, and Colin mentioned the Chilliwack. It's like a perfect place to study dippers. I mean, it is a highly productive system and uh, very fam a famous um, salmon and steelhead river. And, uh, and there's the you know, road follows the river all the way up to the park from, from down in, in the Vedder. And, uh, and the fishermen over the many years have cut little, little paths down at so many places. So, it's such uh, an accessible situation to study dippers. And there are a lot of dippers on that river. Again, as Colin mentioned, the highest density, and as we were discussing earlier, they're very habituated to people. So a very easy place um, to, to work on dippers. It was absolutely perfect. So what I'm gonna do this evening is, is start with some background dipper biology, then talk about some of that early work on the Chilliwack, just really basic, um, but really high quality field biology, field ecology, <clears throat> and then talk a little bit about how we've applied what we learned on dippers to study some other particular uh, environmental issues. There's run of the river, hydro development, and the coal mining in the Kootenays. So yes, <clears throat> the dipper is, I'm going to have to move something here. It's, where am I going to put that? It's obstructing the, the view. Okay, that's much better. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they are the only truly aquatic um, songbird. They are really quite dependent on uh, rushing primarily unpolluted waters. But as long as they find those kind of situations, they can be mountain coastal, they can even be desert streams in parts of the US, other parts of the world with other different species. They're non-migratory. So they, at least in a latitudinal sense, they stay around the stream or the river, but, and we'll talk about some of the, the details and intricacies of that as we go on. I, I'd just like to point out um, this little icon here of the dipper and this is one of our students put that together and I'd completely forgotten about it, it almost looks like it's carrying a, a dream catcher on the back or something but one of our students Helmi Hess pulled this together and that's actually meant to be the little dipper in there behind it that's carrying on its back so I thought that was kind of cute so worth mentioning so yeah um, there are worldwide there are five um, dipper species. You can see the most widely distributed is the, the white-throated dipper or the Eurasian dipper of, of Europe and much of uh, Western Asia, the brown dipper in Eastern Asia, and then our American dipper is the next most widely distributed in the green in the North American map, the white-capped dip, dipper of the Andes, and then this little population of rufous-throated dippers 
down in the southern portion of, of the Andes, down into Argentina. So generally, all of these are, um, <clears throat> are of least concern from a conservation point of view, fortunately, with the exception of that rufous-throated dipper. There are some concerns about that species, uh, I guess because of changes in river management in, uh, in Argentina. It is a declining population. And there has been some you know, persecution of dippers in the past in Scotland, Germany, different places. They're perceived as, as eating too many salmon eggs. And, uh, but I mean, it, it's all one of those kind of nonsense things. It doesn't stand up to any, any scrutiny. And, and that was probably up until the beginning of the 20th century when, when those bounties were removed. So, <clears throat> yeah, so the R dipper, the American dipper, is uh, very, I mean, all of these dippers have really interesting adaptations. But I meant, I gotta go back here. Sorry, <laughs> jumping around the slides. Yeah, um, I wanted to cover some of the adaptations and using the, these pictures of them foraging in that cold water. They have a particularly low metabolic rate, they have um, extra oxygen carrying capacity, high hemoglobin content, and uh, this low basal metabolic rate is about a third lower in your typical passerine. So they're highly physiologically adapted to this cold water world that they live in. And if you've been watching dippers, particularly in winter, you probably wondered how, how does this critter survive in these situations? And they also have a very thick um, feather coating, so highly insulated. And apparently there's stories of uh, this population in these mountains, the Suntar Kayata Mountains of Siberia, where they're actually foraging in these hot springs with air temperatures at minus 55, which is quite amazing. So yeah, and, and they have, uh, other adaptations as well, unlike ducks and other water birds, they don't have um, web feet, but they have um, these extremely muscular um, wings that enable them essentially to use them as flippers underwater. And other interesting adaptations, uh, their bones are solid instead of being hollow like most birds, which reduces their buoyancy. And they have a very um, large preen, gl preen gland at the base of the tail for waterproofing their feathers. And another interesting adaptation is their very relatively long legs for, for a pasture and, and very sharp claws that enable them to uh, move around in those rocks and feed on invertebrates, and uh, which are the, their main prey, although they, they feed on salmonids as well, and as we were talking earlier, certainly on uh, salmonid eggs. <clears throat> Some other interesting adaptations their eyes have this particular musculature that enables them to change the curvature of the lens and adapt to um, different conditions underwater in, in order to improve their vision. And then they have nasal flaps that uh, cover their nostrils when they're underwater. So they are remarkably well adapted. So it's not surprising that they're so successful in, in different parts of the world, the different species. So yeah, regarding their life history, they begin to pair up on the rivers in January. So it's not that far away that you'll be able to start watching them um, interacting together, the males and the females. They start laying late March on into early April, but they'll continue uh, in some cases with second broods on into June. And uh, sorry dog was about to visit. We have, we have a very large puppy. I, I thought my daughter was watching watching her. Um, yes, and they, they, they uh, incubate those eggs for 14 to 17 days and, uh, and then the fledgings leave at 25 days. So those nest mates from the same nest, they stay together for about, about a week or so post-fledge, but the parents will continue to feed them uh, for another 35 days. And another little interesting um, tidbit of information 
Uh, apparently, the oldest recorded American Dipper was eight years old. It was captured and re-released during a banding operation in, in South Dakota. So who knows how much longer uh, it may have lived, but uh, the, the oldest confirmed age is, is eight years. <clears throat> so once they, once they start their, their breeding, um, there's four stages of courtship that you can observe. The first being just tolerating each other in January. So starting to interact and, and not chasing each other off out of their feeding territory. And then they'll start um, courtship feeding. The male will start bringing food. Another interesting thing about dippers is that both the males and the females sing. So they'll start singing to each other and interacting. And then they'll start, and you, if you've spent time like Colin, certainly has, you, you'll see them um, on into early, into early March and that chasing each other back and forth along the river. And you may have wondered what they're doing. Is it, uh, is it territorial? Is it a male chasing away another male or female or female or whatever? But it's uh, all part of a courtship display. And uh, then two to four weeks after they form a pair bond, they'll start copulating. And apparently both adults, I mean, you can't obviously tell them apart, they're not dimorphic, will build a nest, but it's, it's primarily the female, I always thought, that um, did much of the, the nest building. Um, during the, the breeding season, they are mainly monogamous, but uh, they, so there's, there's, I don't think there's any evidence of like extra pair copulation type stuff during the breeding season, but they don't, they don't necessarily maintain that pair bond for life. I mean, they'll split and then find another mate, is my recollection. So another thing that, uh, unlike a lot of songbirds, but more similar to ducks, which is interesting because uh, ducks being another aquatic critter, of course, um, they molt their wing and tail feathers all at once in late summer. And during that time, they're they're like a lot of ducks. They're they're flightless, so so you may notice that if you're out on the the river and you notice them in the in the um, later in the summer that they're not flying around. <laughs> so yeah, they start to to lay eggs um, up to two weeks after nest completion, and they lay uh, an egg each day. The normal clutch is four to five eggs. And incubation is 14 to 17 days. That usually starts after the after the final next to final egg. And uh, the female does the brooding and uh, sits for 30 minutes to an hour on the nest and then uh, takes breaks for up to 20 minutes. So yeah, the nest, the nest structure. We're, we're talking about that ahead of time. They're definitely really interesting um, nests and they can be found in a lot of different situations. These are all nests that were taken, pictures that were taken of nests up in the East Kootenays by the student Helmy that I mentioned that did that little icon with the, with the little dipper. And uh, as you can see the different shapes of nests and different situations and logs and, and even sort of, a protuberance in a waterfall and whatnot. So the um, the female starts building the nest uh, often when it's still freezing. And you can you can watch them collecting nest material, moss and that, and they actually wave it around in the water ahead of time. And then she starts to, to weave it and it's quite a complex nest as uh, an outer shell it can be as much as eight to 10 inches in diameter and it's primarily of moss. And then an inner chamber with a woven cup that's um, quite a bit smaller, two to three inches in diameter, that is grass, leaves, and bark. And so the, the structure appears to work by the, um, the mossy shell absorbs moisture and, and keeps the moisture and precipitation that from getting through. And then the coarse grass inside keeps the actual um, nest cup dry. So again, it's a extremely well adapted structure for the, for the habitat that these, these birds live in. So here's some other pictures, and this is Colin's picture from up on the Coquitlam, this nest out on the boulder, and you can see the bird. Very nice shot. Is it going in or coming out? 
It's not backing out. It's going in, right? It's just going in, yeah. Yeah, nice. That was fascinating. I'm bad. It was so nice. exposed to everything, you know. Uh, there's there's ravens around and red tail hawks, but there it was, completely exposed out in the middle of the yeah. river. It was, yeah, interesting. They, they do get predated. Predation is a is an issue with them. So ravens, corvids, but also mink and and other critters. So yeah, and just some other some other nest pictures from different situations and under bridges and, and boulders, cliff faces. And uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. There's there's a, a nest under a bridge. And we were talking earlier in, in some parts of the whale of the world, like whales, almost all of the nests are, are under bridges or in other other man-made structures. And some of them have been there for a, a long, long time. So yeah, just some more. Oh yeah, oh yeah. This is a picture from from where the nest is located. So I thought it was. Uh, you can see the prime real estate that this bird has got. So she's got the. Uh, they've got the view of um, of their feeding and foraging habitat from their nest. So it's kind of nice. So at the nestling stage, um, both parents uh, participate in feeding, actively feeding the nestlings. Food is collected primarily three to 400 meters max from the nest. And uh, it's interesting because at day 12 post-hatch, the, the legs of the nestlings are only halfway through growing or already as long as, as adult legs. So they're, they're quite a gangly creature. And they're at 55 grams by day 16. And by day 17, um, they can apparently swim. I guess if they fall in, <laughs> whatever. Um, I don't think I've, I've never observed any of that type of behavior because they don't actually fledge till more like 24 to 26 um, days. So yeah, so, so that at that point, uh, average of about 25 days, uh, they'll leave the nest, but they stay quite close to the nest initially. As we said earlier, the, the nest mates uh, remain close together and the parents continue to feed for, for over a month. And the, the parents may actually split the brood. Each may go with, uh, with two or more um, nestlings and focus on them. So yeah, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll feed one nestling quite a few times and then leave it for, for 30 minutes or more. So at that stage, um, on into April, May, if you're up there watching, you'll get, you'll see them regularly. You can see the the begging of the chicks and the and the adults responding and, and feeding them. So yeah, so yeah, so that finishes what I was going to say about um, the basic biology, uh, and then I was going to talk about this uh, work we did developing them as a bioindicator. Did, did anybody have any any questions to, to this point? So, okay, so let, let's go on to, to this work. And as I said at the beginning, uh, this was work that, that Christy Morrissey started back in the, in the around 2000, early 2000s, and uh, with the focus on the Chilliwack River watershed. And one of the first things that she wanted to resolve, that collectively we wanted to resolve, um, was this observation that people had made for many years about the large influx of dippers in places like the Chilliwack and other rivers during the winter. And people had wondered for a long time, where, where were these birds coming from? Because all the indications were from other studies and other dippers that they didn't um, actually migrate. But there was some thinking that perhaps they were coming from the interior um, down to the coast to places like Chilliwack. Or were they um, altitudinal migrants? Were they coming from further up in the watershed and as winter set in and the tributaries started to freeze in that, they were moving down. And so this is 
um, some data that that shows that you can see the the much higher numbers up to getting almost 200 birds on on the Chilliwack in uh, November on into January, and then the numbers go down to a fraction of that um, by the time breeding season comes around. So that was the question: Where do these guys come from? So in order to uh, study this population structure movement, Christy and, and her um, field assistants worked extremely hard. Um, they captured and color banded 250 adult dippers, 272 juveniles, and then they did these surveys as shown in that previous um, data every couple of months. And then they also did a radio telemetry study. So here you can see the color bands so you, you trap the dippers, you put the, the bands on, but then you have to go up and, and those every two months and put the time in to observe and record where you're seeing those, um, those color banded birds. And color banding is a really powerful tool to do um, avian um, demographic studies population biology studies, because you need to be able to identify individuals in order to understand uh, what is going on and develop models of, of population structure and whatnot. So, and, and, it's, and it's a very effective technique. I, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen color banded birds of one sort or another, that were tagged as part of one study or another. And the other thing they, that uh, she did back then was traditional radio telemetry. So um, VHF, so very high frequency. Um, but these are ones where you have to follow the bird around with, with the uh, receiver and, and record it and locate it. Unlike a lot of the really high tech stuff now where you can either get sightings from cell phone um, towers and, and lots of other things, but but this this old technique like this enables you to get very fine scale data as well in terms of movement. If you're wondering how how the dippers are caught, this was a, a technique that was developed in Wales, and it, and uh, it takes advantage of the fact that dippers um, are constantly flying up and down the river to feed, and then particularly get when it gets to the to the breeding season, as I, as I was saying there earlier, um, the courtship um, flights and, and interactions. So if you string mist nets out across the stream, um, it doesn't take long before you'll, you'll, let, you'll catch both pairs. And uh, this is actually a, one of the um, run of the river sites uh, up above um, Pemberton that I'm going to talk a little bit about later. So you can see, you can see where it is Christy and, and Veronica Silverthorne, another grad student on the other side. So you, you can see where they're stringing the net across and uh, catching the little guys. So having that color marked population and then going out and doing the observations of who's where and when, you can get this kind of information so uh, the non-resident birds are in the, the light blue and the residents are the dark blue. And so you can see that those uh, big winter influxes are all of the non-resident birds. And then what she learned was that almost uh, 85 to 90 percent of the dippers were moving upstream under the creeks in, in the spring. So that's where they were coming from. That's where they were going was all the, the tributary creeks and a much smaller portion was were remaining on the river itself. So the creek habitat is really quite different. It's um, gets to be really quite high elevation, very narrow um, corridors, steep gradients, very dynamic flow rates, but many great nesting sites, rocks, cliffs, waterfalls, but very hard to work in these systems. There, there's no road running alongside. Um, some of the, the well-fished creeks do have fishermen's trails partway up in places where you can access, but otherwise it's, it's hard work, a lot of bushwhacking to where you can get up and, and place nets somewhat. So um, very hard one 
information. He very committed um, to this field work to be able to do it. So, whereas the river is really quite different habitat, lower elevation, it's wide, low gradient, but much uh, less in the way of boulders and cliffs, and also the parts of it are are channelized. So, by people and their activities. So uh, having that, that marked population, like I say, enabled a lot of other types of studies to be done. Um, Christy uh, did really detailed diet and feeding ecology uh, using um, other more, quite a, much more um, technologically complex tools, things like um, what are called stable isotopes, which require um, quite sophisticated chemistry to take advantage of, of the different isotopes of nitrogen and carbon, sulfur, and very powerful tools in ecology to, um, to be able to um, get insight into diet just from like a feather sample or a fecal sample. And she did detailed work on uh, reproductive success on, on the breeding of the birds and then applied a lot of it to looking at water quality and uh, contaminant effects, particularly um, atmospherically transported contaminants from the Fraser Valley. And, uh, and there's some quite interesting work. And then subsequently, the behavioral ecology people for a number of years took advantage of that, that MARC system and did some uh, basic evolutionary ecology type work on the dippers up there. So, and, and that work inspired uh, the developing of the dippers of bioindicator, uh, inspired a lot of other um, studies subsequently, such as selenium from uh, coal mining, mercury from gold mining is down in Oregon, another selenium study on the Alberta side. Um, looking at transport of marine pollutants by salmon. And, and a recent study down in the, um, the Olympic Peninsula on this Elwha Valley where they removed a dam and uh, looked at the impact on dippers and found that once the salmon returned uh, to the river, it, it had made major, major changes to, uh, to the uh, ecology and a variety of different um, species returned, otters, dippers, and, and uh, a variety of ducks. And then what I'm gonna talk about here a little bit, this uh, work with Run of the River Hydro you know, up around the Pemberton area. And then I'll just talk very briefly about um, the selenium and, and gold from coal mining in, in the Kootenays. So yeah. <clears throat> This is this uh, study that we did a few years back to use the dipper to uh, investigate the development of running the river hydro. And uh, we were interested also in mercury exposure, but also in how they were affecting the ecology. I don't know, for some reason, I, this, this, I should have checked the, uh, Selena, I should have checked the uh, the settings on this because I think it's on an auto time, this section of the talk, which might be a little bit annoying. Might have to go back and forth, but I don't want to go out and, and go in and change that. So we'll just have to, to bear with it. Okay. So I don't know how much any of you know uh, about run of the river hydropower. Yeah, see, it's it's doing it's it's working on its own. So I just have to try to override it. Um, I don't know what you thought when I heard of run of the river, I, I thought maybe they just take a, a generator and stick it in the, in the water and then, you know, run, run wires and get, to, and get their electricity from them. But it's really not the case at all. It, it's really just a smaller version of a, of a classic hydro development with a reservoir. But so much of the of the world's large rivers and dams or, or streams of the, the large rivers have already been um, dammed and fragmented. And so this run of the river type small stream development is, is one of the last sort of options for generating electricity using hydro. And um, 
So, but they're quite, they are also quite different from the traditional large river dams. They uh, are on these steep streams, but they still, they still install a dam. I, didn't, I hadn't realized that. And then they run the, uh, the water down this, what they call a penstock to the generator below. And it's not shown here, but some of these generators receive um, the flow from a variety of these run of the river dams. And uh, there you can see the head pond and then they run the, uh, the water down to the generator. So and most of them are, are relatively smaller, less than 50 megawatts, but it's still a lot of, a lot of power that they're developing, uh, producing from these things. And so, yes, a uh, hydro map pointing out the, the potential for run of the river in BC, all those blue dots, the green are, are protected areas. And so there's a lot of potential in BC for, for this type of development. And, um, and, and everything that goes with it. And uh, in particular, from what I've seen, uh, as with so much of this type of resource development in BC, it's, it's the road building and everything that comes with uh, providing road access into these places. But this type of development is eligible for, for green energy subsidies. It, it is a relatively, let's face it, there's no free energy. It, it is a relatively cleaner way, obviously. We're very fortunate in, in BC for having so much hydro. But same time, we were wondering, you know, was, was it having any consequences? So, so these are the, some of the potential um, impacts that we identified. Um, reduced and stabilized flow regime, which is the, the same issue with all um, hydro development. Potential to change the stream physiochemistry within the reservoir and, and downstream, and that actually had been shown in other studies. And would that affect the fish and macroinvertebrate um, abundance and diversity? And then also the potential to produce uh, methylmercury in the reservoir. So yes, this is a problem that's been identified with hydro reservoirs for, for a long time, um, I guess at least 50, 60 years, that uh, when the soil is flooded and the, and the vegetation starts to rot, mercury gets, that's naturally present, gets mobilized. And uh, what's not showing here is that Let's see, do we have it further down? It doesn't show it, that once you get these situations, you get these um, methylating uh, bacteria that uh, work during, in these anaerobic conditions, so oxygen poor conditions, and they convert mercury. And elemental mercury is, is by itself generally not a problem. It's not until it's converted to methylmercury that it's uh, much more, um, bioaccumulative and also much more toxic. And uh, so at high enough concentrations, and they don't have to be that high, and there's a lot of species variation sensitivity to mercury, it um, will affect a lot of, a lot of um, functions, particularly uh, neurological functions, but also immune system and, and other systems. So yeah, so that's the the potential impacts that we, we identified from these. And this was the study area that we identified um, up in around Pemberton and uh, Lillooet uh, drainages. So like working on the Chillac, we mentioned, you, you're gonna do this sort of stuff. You have to find a, a system that's amenable to getting in there and doing the field biology. And also you have to find um, industry collaborators that are willing to work with you and willing to support what you're doing. So we identified all of that and uh, all takes a lot of time <laughs> negotiating with industry to get access and to get over their paranoia that uh, you're just gonna be telling all these stories about how nasty they are. So no, we're just gonna do the science. And if the science shows that there's negative results, well, then it's what the science shows. And, 
if it doesn't show it, then you've got nothing to hide and you should be pleased. And so, yes, we managed to convince them and get up into these, uh, to these uh, rather river sites up in that area above uh, Whistler Pemberton. So one of the uh, things we were interested in was how it was affecting the, the dipper ecology. So this is the, the design. So we had seven regulated streams. So ones that had, jumping ahead on me, ones that had um, rather the river developments on them and seven unregulated. So ones that didn't have uh, any development. And almost a hundred dippers were um, caught, color banded, measured, and and blood and feathers sampled over these um, two win or two autumns. And also managed to recap recapture a, th uh, a few, and then did these independent um, double double observer um, surveys throughout the fall and in the spring and summer to to find out what these um, color marked birds were up to. So you can see their one kilometer survey transect. So again, a lot of uh, a lot of intense field work, and uh, and and a lot of hard won data in the end to do this work. But also, if if you like systems like that and you like working with birds, also a lot of fun. So just to summarize the habitat use aspects of these streams. We actually found that in the regulated streams, there was increased dipper density. And there was a significantly higher portion of the adult birds on the unregulated streams. So, and also a higher occupancy of the, the banded birds and a higher proportion of confirmed year round residents. So, the dippers, they seem to quite like these regulated systems. And um, wondering if it's creating actually novel habitat for both the breeding and non-breeding birds. It's actually putting structure on these streams, altering the flow, maybe increasing the availability of, of some forms of food. So that's what we learned from that, that uh, from the point of view of the developers, it wasn't really bad news although we're not 100% sure what to make of it. In terms of the mercury, overall, you can see the, the reference streams and the white bars on the far left, the white bar, and these are the dark bars are the regulated streams. So um, you can consider the, the white bars like a reference or a, or a control situation. And um, the y-axis of the, I don't know whether my mouse shows up. Does the mouse show up on, on yours? Can you see it? No. Does the, does the icon show up? Oh, actually, yes, I can see it now. Yeah, I can see it. yeah so here on the y-axis, these are the concentrations of, uh, of mercury in the dipper blood. In, uh, if it means anything to you, basically in micrograms per gram or, or parts per million. And then you can see that for the most part, they're not particularly more contaminated in the reference, except this one creek, this Douglas Creek. And it's interesting because it's the newest of the dams. And other work uh, has shown that it's, it's the, the younger, the newer dams that tend to have the most mercury contamination. With time, the mercury does appear to, to dissipate from these systems. And, um, for example, other, other studies looking at um, mercury production in beaver ponds also found the same thing, that it's the most recently inundated ponds that, that had the highest mercury. In terms of what this means and what do these mercury concentrations mean, um, I hope I can just guide you through here. So this is from a, a review of blood mercury actually a review that I was involved with from a few years back in 2016 by colleagues in the US. So these again are concentrations and parts per million of the, of the mercury on the y-axis here. And these are all um, different pasturing birds from across North America. You can see, well, not just pasturings, but common ravens, 
you can tanagers, red winged blackbirds, all the way across. The most um, contaminated one was this uh, Nelson sparrow. And then if we look at our dipper samples, you can see that they're much higher than, than what has been found in, in past range generally across North America. If we look at the, the red bar are the unregulated streams. And then if we look at the, the regulated streams, you can see that it's quite a bit, quite a bit higher. And then Douglas Creek is uh, overall the highest. Hmm. If I'm interpreting that right. It's been a while I looked at this. So, yeah, so what does this all mean in summary? The question is, are these run-of-the-river head ponds ecological or evolutionary traps? So they are changing the, the flow regime of the rivers, and it appears to be changed. The dippers appear to be adapting and changing to that and actually taking advantage of it. But at the same time, we weren't able to do, we didn't have the resources or the funding or the time to do reproductive studies. So we have no idea whether there's any changes in the, the actual nesting success on these different systems. And also the question is, um, is this um, non-adaptive to be um, feeding on these kind of artificial systems? and uh, is so it actually not in the long run, not actually good for them? And then the questions of whether this methylmercury is having any impacts is, is not, a, from, from our work, not entirely clear. So that's what you can learn from a, from a two year study. So, but it was, you know, certainly interesting and, and we certainly increased the, the knowledge because there was nothing before this. Okay, so now I'm going to move to this other um, application of the dippers to um, looking at a, an environmental issue. And this is in the Yelk Valley in southeastern BC. So it's uh, an important area for, for the local economy, for fishing and recreational activities and natural habitat for many species, but it's also the focus of, uh, of, of a lot of uh, coal mining, a very profitable coal mining. So currently there's uh, five active open pit coal mines and employ over 4,000 people and produce 27.6 million tons of coal and over $2 billion gross, gross profit. So, as many of you probably know, those trains coming down from the interior and going out to the coal port um, are coming mainly from up in that region. And at the same time, there were proposals for, I think, at least five or if not seven new mines by tech resources and other coal mining companies. So that's how we ended up getting involved. We had been asked repeatedly by the environmental impact people who were trying to review these proposals, if we could do some further work on, on an avian indicator up there, dippers or, or whatever. And um, we managed to pull some funding together and we, we definitely didn't give us any money, <laughs> but they had a lot of, we had a lot of support from, the, from some of the mining operations to access the, uh, the sites and and uh, collaborate with us to some degree. So, and the issue with, um, with coal mining is the production of this element, selenium, release into the aquatic systems, very high concentration. So selenium is, uh, is an essential element for maintenance of, of many um, bodily functions, liver, heart, in, in all uh, warm-blooded, creatures. Uh, it's essential for the, for the synthesis of uh, selenoproteins, which are essential for a lot of critical functions and for functions such as oxidative stress response. However, above trace concentrations, this element um, can be very toxic and um, teratogenic, as in causing deformities in, in uh, offspring. So they, the province of BC 
um, designated a guideline of, um, you can see it here, this guideline for wildlife of two, two micrograms um, per liter of selenium. So you can see these, and these are concentrations of selenium in these various streams um, up in the Elk, Elk Valley area. So you can see they're, they're uh, greatly exceeding the water quality guidelines. So this has caused a lot of um, concern. And there's been a lot of studies of fish in particular and invertebrates that have gone on up there by various academic groups and uh, some government involvement. And the mining industry has been doing their own studies, but we don't necessarily see that. And uh, so we wanted to, to look at the dippers and we were strongly encouraged by the regulatory people to, to do some kind of work on another, another type of wildlife. It was a lot of fish data. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this. I think it's probably late enough as it is. You know, we're certainly getting on. And um, so we did a, a study over a couple of years um, looking at selenium in in, uh, in the dippers and aquatic songbirds. So basically what I can tell you in a caption is uh, we found you know high levels in the, in the water in the biota and the whole food chain leading up to the dippers but we didn't detect any effects of selenium on the reproduction on the hatching success of the dippers up in these areas however we were only able to do a, a one year study unfortunately the the grad student um, ran into personal problems and we she wasn't able to do a second year and i always have concerns about basing the data on a single year because there can be so much variability from year to year in, in avian um, reproduction. But at any rate, we, um, that's, that's what we found and it's now published and the, the industry have it and the regulators have it and, uh, and whether any more work is done or more done on other species and spotted sandpipers, I don't know, but I'm not gonna be doing it. <laughs> don't want to work up there anymore so yeah so that's what i had to say this evening about dippers biology and application of dippers and uh have to acknowledge as i said i'm the third or fourth string dipper presenter here the the people who have contributed slides and and been doing this work over the years so christine um, Bishop, who is another environment and climate change Canada um, scientist. Uh, she works mainly on endangered species. And I noticed she's not holding a dipper there. She's holding a frog. And, uh, and Christy Morrissey, who's now a professor and has been for 10 or 12 years at the University of uh, Saskatchewan, and then Veronica Silverthorne, who uh, was a grad student doing that work up there. Her last name was Newbury at that time. So she's worked for us for quite a few years, but she's actually... Um, moved to the island and uh, they, her and her husband have bought a farm. So I don't know how much more biology she's gonna be doing. So with that, I can take any questions.